I never had any college training. I went right into farming right out of high school. And the only way I could learn things was by making mistakes. So that's what I did, and I survived them. So I'm as educated as I can afford to be. So now I'm trying to share some of that with you. Thank you. So that gives you a little taste of where I'm at. So full circle farming. That's the title of my talk today. Hi, I'm Joe Borgening. My story today is about how a person with good intentions can make a lot of wrong turns and still get to where he needs to go. Where do we start? Well, I guess typical eight-year-old farm kid would have described me pretty well. Being the tenth of 12 kids on a farm with cows, pigs, and chickens, that was pretty common. My only claim to fame was having eight sisters in a row before me, so dad was anxious to get me trained in to help him farm. Mom had me washing eggs for two years, but now I was finally old enough to help dad. I had memorized all the gears on all the tractors, but dad thought I should first learn to drive a wheelbarrow. Then if I wanted to pull the rock trailer with the tractor, I had to help fill it up first. That simple logic was never that obvious to an eight-year-old, believe me. Before long, my younger brother and I were doing all sorts of things, but the most important daily job, pitching out the silage and wheeling it out to the 50 cows. Just imagine my surprise one spring day when I arrived in the barn and all I could hear were the sparrows. No fans, and what the heck, no hungry cows. Dad had decided that the grass was ready for grazing and we didn't have to feed any silage or hay or even give them straw. Wow, how can you not like grazing cows on pasture? Besides that, we never had to pick rocks in the pasture. Our new freedom was soon spent getting cows home from milking and since another older sister had just graduated, I got promoted to washing cows off for milking. Milking gives a kid, a, gives a kid time to do some thinking. And what I was thinking was, that the cow's bags were getting smaller and smaller each week and dirtier. The, the cows were going farther back into the muddy part of the pasture where the grass was tall and the short grass in front of the pasture never seemed to grow back all summer long. Later that summer, we had a big surprise. A crew came, dug a big round hole in the backyard. We were getting a new silo, way bigger than our old ones. It didn't take long. We had what had to be the biggest silo in Stearns County. Since we were used to pitching out the old silo, I wondered who was going to empty this monster once it was full. I sure wanted to climb up that big new silo, but I figured Dad would say, don't forget the fork. Before long, that crew came back with a brand new silo and loader and an auger to feed it in the bunk that we were building. We couldn't believe it. It cost a lot of money, but now we could keep the cows out of the mud and not have to bale so much hay. Times were changing, and I wasn't complaining. The new feed guy said we could buy this protein mix and get more milk with a lot less work. Since we didn't pasture the cows anymore, we plowed up a lot of the pasture ground so we could grow more corn to fill the silo. Russia was looking for more grain too about that time, so the timing was good. Since we had so many more corn acres now, we had to buy nitrogen, and anhydrous was the cheapest way to get it. The agronomy guy said he recommended a program approach with single cross seed corn, chemical herbicide, and some insecticide for the corn borers. One day, Dad said he needed me to spray the corn. Since I was getting tired of cultivating all summer, it seemed like fun to spray with a 30-foot boom going over four miles an hour. One day, while waiting for the sprayer to fill, I happened to read the chart on the back of the chemical bag, just to be sure I was doing it right. The chart seemed right, but there was a note under it. It seems that if you have high organic matter, you need to use twice the rate to get the best control. Wow, needless to say, Dad had to buy a lot more atrazine after that. Soon I was in charge of the spraying. <clears throat> now we had clean corn, oats, and soybeans. I even got the bugs all out of the hay. When we quit using the old cultivator, we completely eliminated the, color, the cultivator blight as well. The corn looked great, but by now, Russia had stopped buying. Lucky for us, our expanded corn base increased our LDP checks. The feed guy said we could cut out some hay and feed more corn in the barn. If we added enough soybean meal, we could even get more milk and not have to bale all that hay. Reducing the hay was nice, since good hay with no grass had to be cut four times a year now. And it didn't seem to grow all that well anyway. The cows milked okay, but we were sure getting to know our vet. Some years we had to buy heifers to keep the barn full, but I made sure we always improved the genetics. Since the feed guy said we would get bigger heifers if we kept them confined, we fed them at the bunk too. 
By now we had another silo unloader, some conveyors, a feed cart, and with all those animals in the barn, it took a lot of fans, a manure pump, and a bigger manure spreader. We were hoping to grow the herd so we could pay off the fertilizer and chemical bills. Since the last of the old oak fence posts were all pulled out by now, we had more to fertilize and spray than ever. Our feed guy asked, why are we still growing oats? Since the government program payments were much better for corn, it was kind of a no-brainer to quit the oats. Besides that, oats didn't grow like it used to anyway. By this time, I was married to a good housekeeper who was wondering, how come with all this good advice, we never had any money? Everything we did to enhance production seemed to cost money. Eventually, we decided we needed to build a bigger barn, a big new freestall barn. We could be more labor efficient and the cows would be more comfortable and get more exercise. If we added more cows, our cost of living per cow would actually be less than before. What could go wrong with that? To build the new barn, we had to first got out the old one, put in a milking parlor. The cows are just going to have to go outside for the summer. When we realized how much straw it was taking to bed them cows outside every day, I thought, why not put them out on some grass? Wait a minute, what grass? We decided to fence in an old hay field and soon learn farmers don't use oak fence posts anymore. We bought T-posts, insulators, and a good fencer. Before long, we had a nice fence and the hay was starting to grow. The milking parlor got finished, but it was going to take all summer to get the barn built. The cows looked great in the new pasture, but soon it was obvious they had no idea how to graze. We fed them a TMR mix in the old bunk, but now we had to find a place for the heifers. More fencing behind the grove, and they were out of the way. They seemed to learn to graze way quicker than the cows did. The new freestall barn was finished just as the snow started to fly, and the cows loved it. Things went pretty well the first winter, but by spring we were thinking of taking down that fence. Then we realized we need a place for more dry cows. It seemed to make sense to just put those dry cows out in that pasture and save a lot of work and bedding. When the feed guy disagreed, I decided, you know, maybe we didn't need him passing out any more free advice. He didn't have to do the extra work seven days a week. It was kind of fun watching those dry cows learn how to graze and eventually even have their calves out in the little pasture out back. I started to read about better ways to manage pasture and even met some farmers who had quit listening to their feed salesmen telling them how to feed their cows. I also met farmers who had quit listening to agronomists and were putting on lime and sulfur instead of all that nitrogen and potash. I started to read old, old farming books just to be sure. Recently we had been having three trouble controlling a new weed out in our cornfields and we were up to three chemicals in a tank mix. Since we had been using the new mix, it seemed like nothing else wanted to grow in those fields after the corn. Another problem we had was the ground was so hard we kept breaking the plow and we couldn't even pull it with our own tractor. Something had to change and I was frustrated enough to make some big changes, even if I had to ignore a lot of free advice. I found out that our heavy soil did need sulfur, after all, since the U.S. had reduced our acid rain, and that our high pH soil was actually short of soluble calcium due to excessive magnesium. One day I realized that I knew more about what is good for my soil than a college-trained agronomist. It was not his fault, but from now on, I will have to be my own soil expert. If you are looking, there are actually a lot of good books to help learn about soils. About this time, we bought hay from another farm, and they had a lot more calcium on that farm. And I watched in amazement how the cows ate it up without sorting it. Then I knew I was on the right track. More calcium and less potash. We added lots of sulfur and boron and less nitrogen. Within a year, we found earthworms growing in our hay fields. When it came time to order all our seed corn, fertilizer, and chemicals for the next spring, we just ordered half as much. We ordered more alfalfa seed and some grass seed to boot. By the middle of the summer, we had more hay than ever and the cows were eating it like candy. The last of the protein mix lasted a long time, so we finally got caught up on the feed bill. In the barn, the cows seemed better, but not, but not how they should. The new cow mats that had been so nice were already falling apart and they were not even paid for yet. The money back warranty was no help since 800 number for the company was no longer listed. Cow comfort is the key to any success on a dairy farm, and we were in a bind. When the hired man said, you know, the dry cows look more comfortable than the milk cows, I agreed. Let's get those cows out of those uncomfortable uncom stalls at least a few hours a day. It just happened there was another hay field to the east that we could make work, and it even had some grass mixed in, in case they wanted to eat some. Before the week was over, we had fenced in the whole field, 
and the cows got to get some exercise, and they even ate some of that grass. A new friend of mine told me to split up the field into small paddocks so the cows could be rotated around in a pattern to harvest more evenly. Boy, this was starting to make sense. Out in the fields, we had really changed how things were done. Since we had cut back the corn acres and eliminated the anhydrous, the soil really started to change. I was annoyed to see the seagulls feasting on our new worms. When it rained, the water soaked in, and when I plowed, it smelled great. As the soil improved, I could really cut back on the chemicals. I even tried raising oats again. It was almost like the oats my dad used to grow. With all the hay and oats in the rotation, I could quit buying insecticides for the corn and the hay. This is starting to work, and if nothing else, I feel like I am my own boss again. One winter I had some time to reflect a bit. I took in some different meetings, and I skipped all those old feed, fertilizer, and chemical dinners. I had made some new friends and liked what they were doing, especially after what I had learned. Profit is not guaranteed from yield, but from margin. Farming is not buying, but selling. Good practices can replace expensive products. Farming with your family can be fun. Spring has come, and by golly, we now have more pasture than ever. I was going to fish, finish some sweeping in the barn, but I had stopped to listen. All I could hear was the sparrows, until Dad walked in behind me and said, Where are all the cows? Thank you.